Hey everybody, welcome to uh, the first uh, HA chat. I'm so excited to be here right now. This is the first time that we're doing this and hopefully we'll get to do this uh, more often. Um, my name is Brian Kramer. I'm really looking forward to, to uh, talking today on uh, millennial marketing. It's marketing plus millennials and I have with me some really excited I'm excited to have some really excited, uh, really exciting guests. <laughs> and uh, the first person that I'll introduce is Ashley Stoll. Ashley is a career coach to Gen Y, a speaker, a blogger. She's a TEDx speaker. Um, she's DC Magazine's top 99 foreign policy leader under 33. Wow. And she also, uh, I met her back east at an event in New York that we held uh, in conjunction with IBM. Uh, very excited to have Ashley with us. Uh, I have as well Samantha Klein, and Samantha, I thank you so much for jumping on uh, here with us today, um, oh, and yeah. especially last minute. Um, I, I'm looking forward to chatting with you as well because we've gotten to know each other over the years, um, and now we get a chance to actually talk about millennial marketing, which is what I understand you were talking about last week at IBM Connect yes. and panel and speaking about. So um, how cool to have you actually here now talking about that with us. Um, you are a manager at, uh, uh, at uh, IBM, and you especially like to talk about millennials, marketing, social business, customer service, retail, cu customer service, Gen Z, brands, tech, and ice cream. Just and a few things. Just and, a few things. And Diet Coke. <laughs> and what? And Diet Coke, always. Well, I thought you said Donald Trump, and I was like... <laughs> One of my favorite topics, yes. <laughs> And we also have Brian Fonzo. Uh, Brian likes to talk fast, and he tweets faster. If you don't know that, that's, if, if you don't believe me, just get on and tweet him. Trust me, I do. And add uh, add Brian's um, uh, add his at Pebble to to any tweet, and watch the tweet on his watch, and that will be really fun for me to sit by and watch. Um, leading change in tech, social media, and social business. He loves to talk about employee advocacy digital strategist, and he's the podcast host of Smack Talk and SB, S Biz Hour, um, so you can rest medicine. So, Brian, great to have you here as well. Excited to be here. Brian with an I is greater than Brian with a Y. That's not what it says in my subtitle, so I'm going to have to go with what's actually written, not what's actually said. Um, so let welcome everybody. I appreciate you guys being here. We're going to talk about millennial marketing. I'm going to kick it off with a softball, and let's just talk real, real, real uh, in general. Uh, let's talk in general about what millennial marketing means. What is what is it right now that that you? What are your beliefs around millennial marketing? Um, some some you know what's your approach and your your thinking around what does that mean? Um, so why don't we kick that off with um, Ashley? Yeah, it's a great question. Thanks for asking it. I think it's important for so many brands and for solopreneurs uh, in connecting with millennials. To me, marketing to millennials means authenticity. Um, we are a generation that believes in the democracy of ideas. And so it, it could mean that you are pushing the envelope of it. It could mean that you're contrarian. Uh, but whatever, whatever you do when you're marketing to millennials, I think it really means connecting with the millennial consumer from a space of authenticity, innovation, and real transparent connection. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. thank you for asking. Um, I, I definitely um, agree, and I see a lot of that um, going on right now and being you know, transparent and, and, and authentic. I think those are two big words that we're probably going to see and hear a lot of, especially here uh, today in this, in this uh, chat. Um, one quick note for everyone out there. I forgot to mention that we are having a Twitter chat alongside this. Um, so if you, if you want to tweet, H, um, sorry, hashtag uh, uh, H2H chat, we have uh, Susie who is running that tweet chat and we'll be asking questions that you pose in the last 30 minutes. So just branching off what you said, Ashley, on, uh, on transparency and authenticity, Brian, what are your thoughts on uh, millennial marketing? No, I, I love that, and Ashley said it so articulately perfect, I will definitely not say it as, as well-defined. But uh, a lot of what I, I you know, I, I like kind of believe in more, there's two kind of conversations going on from a marketing perspective. One, if you're targeting and talking and focusing around millennials as someone that was born between 1980 and early 2000, and then there's another conversation when you're targeting people that are hyper-connected, digitally focused, and change, you know, 
in, enabled and lovers of change. Because I think, you know, I talk about the millennial mindset a lot because I think there's lots of people that kind of miss, uh, mistake the fact that only millennials are on social media or only millennials care about transparency and authenticity. And I think that's wrong. I think it's actually the millennials have the bigger chunk of the people, but the millennial mindset, there's plenty of people that are older that are also embrace those same traits. So I think part of that marketing comes down to we want to, we as a, a connected digital millennial mindset want to be talked with. We want to know our voice counts and that authenticity starts by sharing and engaging, providing value. You know, I, I, I think if you watch you know, Saturday Night Live, Saturday Night Live 40 last night was hilarious. Everybody's feeds were blowing up about it. And one of the things that hit me was why has Saturday Night Live been on for 40 years? Yeah, there's other comedy, there's other shows on. It's because it's raw, it's real, it's in your face, and it just provides you value of laughter every week. And I think that's a great lesson for people that are trying to get in touch and talk with millennials. Because if you're real, if you're humanized, that's going to matter. Unfortunately, too many try to talk at, just spam, and like, oh, millennials care about, they're on Facebook, so you just insert your same billboard ad inside Facebook. That's not what's going to get you value uh, you know, marketing towards millennials. It's understanding, listening, showing that you're listening. And I think that's the game changer. Some brands are doing it. Other ones, well, millennials are tuning them out. Ryan, I believe you use the word human. <laughs> <laughs> so I just yes. wanted to make sure that we applauded that. Um, Samantha, what? Tell me a little bit about your your idea, your definition of um, of uh, being a millennial marketer. So. Everything I totally agree with what Ashley and Brian are saying, and I think when you look at everything that they're saying and kind of sum it up, what does it come down to at the end of the day? What's the one word that, that defines marketing to millennials or to the millennial minded? I think that word is trust, right? Through being authentic, through being transparent, through being human. I said human. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, through being all those things, you're establishing trust. Um, with with people with that millennial millennial minded mindset, um, I think that millennials grew up with the internet at their fingertips, and they the you know and and with cyber attacks and with getting emails that have you know signing up to give your information or data to a company and then presenting with you with totally irrelevant you know information and and offers and all of that. I think that when it comes to to companies marketing to millennials to try to get them to work with them, and when it comes to products marketing to millennials, it's trying to get them to, to use their product. I think if you don't have trust, you're not going to get that consumer and they're not going to listen to you. So, and I think that that trust comes down to the way to build it is really through personalization and customization. So kind of making the message relevant to whomever you're trying to speak to, um, and also targeting them or, or getting to them on the right channels. If you're giving them the right message, on Twitter, but they are not active on Twitter, and they, you know, they go for shopping or online shopping. They're using Facebook for that. It doesn't matter what you're saying. You got to say it on the right platform. It's a lot. It's a lot to ask from marketers and from companies and from all that. Um, but it is what it is. So that you've got to figure it out. Hmm. That's great. Uh, I love that. Um, and I think um, you know the trust factor. That that's a let's let's um, let's dive into that a little bit more. Um, what. What I know you said personalization helps to build trust and and helping to build a relationship, but what to, give me more on that? How do we build trust with millennials? Hmm. I think you have to put them at your level, right? Like it doesn't matter what's on your business card, what age you are, um, kind of what where you know what what office, whether you sit in the corner office or you sit in a cubicle, that or if you work from home, none of that matters. I think it all has to do kind of with with merit in a way, right? With with what that person can actually contribute um, and what they can add to the conversation. So marketers not looking at at these consumers quite so as consumers, but rather consumers that can help them with their product. That can kind of you know whether it's crowdsourcing ideas or something. Millennials want to be or millennial minded people want to be involved in the process. And if you feel like they're tapping into you because they actually value what you're saying then they're more likely to trust whatever brand or company that is. Oh, that's great. How about, Ashley, how about yourself? How do you Yeah, I'm this? wanting to jump in on this. I think it's such an exciting topic, and I think really the essence of trust with millennials, um, there's two different fronts, right? You have corporate and then you have solopreneurs, service providers. On my end as a service provider, um, I email thousands of subscribers every week, and they're all millennials, and what I found is that 
the posts that do the best with my, my community are really the ones where I'm being vulnerable. And I think that that's a real element of trust building is the vulnerability. Um, authenticity and vulnerability, especially when you're a service provider, is a practice and it's a choice. You can either flock your feathers and try to put up a front and put up a brand that's really strong but not penetrable. Or you can be authentic and vulnerable with your community uh, because at the end of the day when it comes to sales conversions or marketing, people buy from the heart. And that doesn't have to be an opportunity where you can manipulate as much as one that you can leverage, especially if what you're selling is going to make their lives better. If they're an ideal client, then it really is your moral obligation to put yourself out there and serve these people. I mean, in a lot of ways, selling is serving, and that comes from an emotional place. Um, I so love that. That you oh, people buy with their heart. I think that's so that's such a brilliant thing to say. And I think when people ask me all the time, is there such thing as a global millennial? Does that exist? Is there something culturally that extends beyond, you know, borders and all that? I think that exactly what, actually what you just said, that people buy with their heart, I think that is so key with millennial and millennial minded people. And I that's always my answer is they don't, you know, they don't necessarily think with their head as much as they're thinking with their heart when they when they make purchases or whatever they're doing. Absolutely. And it's an emotional decision when you buy something. I mean, people usually think about money after they think about their feelings. And so Really, truly, not only on the solopreneur front, but on the corporate front, um, you, you might not necessarily be able to strike a personal chord with the millennial um, if your brand isn't being represented by a person as much as a brand and a team. And if that's the case, you know, in your case, Samantha, at IBM, then I would say really leading from a place of cause. Um, that taps into the heart as well. So um, for me as a solopreneur, it comes from my personality, my energy, my daily life, sharing with my subscribers what's going on with me, serving them in their job hunt. On your end, it probably comes from a place of cause and meaning. And really, like Simon Sinek's TED Talk about the power of why, really tapping into the purpose and why um, IBM is taking the initiatives it is, or why Pure Matter, or why Brian at so iSocial Fans does the work he does. That is what's going to make the conversion. So yeah, thank you so much for bringing that point up even more so about buying from the heart, because I think that that is the essence of trust. I love that, and I think really when it comes down to it, what you said there, it's not about telling us what you want us to buy. It's telling us how and why, how it's going to make our lives better, and why we should do it. Give us a reason, and that starts that starts with actually you know providing the value before we even know we need it. And I think that's something that is important. And oftentimes they think about you know, and I even saw in the Twitter chat going across, people were asking the idea of like you know some brands don't feel that they're uh, attractive or currently targeting millennials. And I like the phrase that is, that millennial mindset is all ages, but millennials influence people that aren't just millennials. And, you know, the millennial generation has, like one of my favorite things that's changed my life is reverse mentoring. And the idea of like a lot of my CEOs, a lot of the bosses in my past life, they reached out to me. I taught them social and how to use their iPhone. They brought me in the board meeting. So the fact that if I was targeted for something that they might care about, I became influential to them in technology, social, digital. So just because I'm not the, the millennial age isn't the typical person purchasing the product, we have to rethink that marketing concept where that the influencer of non-millennials also, can also be millennials because I think that's a, kind of a, a changing in the, in the guard of way things work. Yeah, I, what, what you just said in, in, in terms of the... the I keep sitting in these in these presentations or calls or, or reading studies that say you know millennials are going to be the business the decision makers in five to ten years and I'm like well if you think about it my boss who you know let's say my boss who's a non millennial well you know, she knows that I know digital and social in that world well so she'll come out of a meeting and she'll say Sam you know we have to think what agency you know what new you know what social dashboard should we be using can you like you know can you give me four recommendations um, or or Sam you know we ask for my opinion. So really, if you think about it, millennials are kind of the business decision makers now in a roundabout way because they're so influential when it comes down to what the decision making is when it comes to digital, social, online. Because the you know people's bosses or the executives know that they know, and if they don't know that and they're not asking them, then that company has got a big problem anyways. But, uh, let, me, let me ask you guys something because you guys are extraordinary uh, people. You guys have a lot of... Uh, um, enthusiasm and you guys are smart and you're knowledgeable and you're oh, shut up, Brian. And so, Brian. <laughs> but here, here the reason that I'm saying all that is because um, you know the general what we're talking about is trust and and um, and being um, authentic and and being flexible 
and, and living in a flexible world. Mm -hmm. So um, how does a company, how do people learn to trust that? Um, you know, you guys are obviously entrepreneurial, but you guys are also all working at home. Mm -hmm. You guys are also uh, free to come and go basically as you please, and hopefully everybody works as hard as they can. How does a company that's companies that are used to saying and demanding, you all need to sit behind the desk between the hours of eight and five because we don't trust that you're not going to get the job done. How are how are you guys seeing that shift so that you can get the work done? Is it a ploy for all millennial marketers to say we need to work at home because that's flexibility, or is there another reason? Or are there other reasons out there for all of this to happen? Well, I, I like to think of it as I actually put the onus on the millennial to start with. So you know, there's lots of I think millennials today that will complain that says my company doesn't trust me, my culture, the culture isn't built there. But I think part of that conversation is you earn trust. And you also, you know, as a as a complete bar, you have to almost build up that good rapport. And so, you know, maybe it's the element of okay, the culture doesn't support working from home. I worked for the Department of Defense as a contractor for nine years. It wasn't until my fifth year there could I convince them that they could trust me to work from home and to have my teams work from home. But never once did I complain and say they don't trust me. What I would do is I and I, I use this term all the time is I I said screenshot awesomeness like I would document along the way of things where they started to trust me and I delivered or over delivered and then I would make sure they remembered that and I think it comes down a little bit of that it also comes down to a changing of of the idea of trust because I'm in your four walls because I'm working nine to five do you really think I'm more productive and you have more of an oversight on me. Because that is, I think that is a mistake. It's just like everything. Just because you can physically reach out and touch it doesn't mean it's more secure or more real than what you're able to do from home, from you know, from remote. So I, I mean, I love that conversation, but I think millennials can't complain. We have to be able to lead and, and build that trust first. But then when it comes back to it, it's about making that you know use cases. And sometimes it's just not going to work, and you're going to have to look for somewhere else. You know, so, um, if I could chime in, oh, go ahead. Okay. Um, I think the question you're really asking, Brian, um, Brian Kramer, is just about this idea of FaceTime, quality versus quantity. How much do we sit in a, ta a table at a, at a desk and uh, put a day in? I think at the end of the day, we are the most educated generation, so we really care about results. Um, we got a degree um, for the for the experience of it, for the knowledge of it, and so it's, it's really, truly, the essence of this comes down to managers understanding how much they need to focus on results not the process. The more you're able, and that doesn't necessarily mean allowing your millennial to work from home um, if you have a millennial employee, but it does mean prizing results more than process. So if a millennial can do a job that takes some people eight hours um, in three, there should be some sort of reward with flexibility or with space to allow that to be the case. Millennials don't respond well to FaceTime, to sitting in a desk, letting the hours pass, we believe in quality of life, and we're an educated generation that believes in using our skills. Um, so the essence of this, I really think, just comes down to results. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with you. And I think it's it's that work is wherever the Wi-Fi is, kind of for the millennial or the millennial-minded uh, generation. And I think it's, and I understand, but Brian, with what you're fan, fans of, what you were saying before is it's funny because these this mixing of the two generations in the workforce. You know, the older generation they go into it where you have to earn your trust. And millennials go into it that they trust from the start, but if you piss them off once, then you've totally lost their trust and that's it, right? But you have to realize that the people that are at the top right now, that are, old, you know, at, at the end of the day, at these big corporations or brands or whatever have you, is that they, they, they're not going to change the way they function. That's how they are. They, you need to earn their trust. So that's what exactly what you're saying. You, you can't just be like, well, I want it this way. They're used to this way. So you've got to figure out a way to earn their trust to present it to them in that way that you're talking about unless you luck out and have people at the top like I do at IBM which is fantastic that that they trust you know 50% of IBM's workforce is remote which is talk about trusting your employees it's pretty awesome yeah I, you know I, and I question the idea when it comes down to that trust and I think actually you brought up a great point on it it doesn't even have to be work from home I, I mean I will pose this question to every leader do you really care about the quality of life of your employees if you do you'll you will in <laughs> What I mean, that's that. Yeah, Brian's like, no, no, I don't tell my. But I don't even think it's really working from home. It's the flexibility options, right? It's enabling them with the the best technology to be the most productive. It's the idea that you would trust them to do certain things for you in your, you know, and and I mean, I, I love that point, Sam, because it's not only that that trust for us, like we 
millennials, the, when we're talking the age group, I mean, we lived through, uh, you know, most of us are, you know, Facebook existed early on in our lives. We lived through a really tough time in the economy and the job market and the housing market. And what that really allowed us to, to learn is that we trust our friends and our community a hell of a lot more than we trust a brand or a logo. And what that means for that brand and logo is empower your employees that you trust to trust that one side down. And like, I think that's where I think that's where you can buy it. So if a middle manager is out there and they want their millennials to be more productive, don't sell the millennials on being trusted. You as the middle manager go to your manager and say, if you trust me, let me give my employees the power to be yeah. flexible. And I think that's where the conversation starts. And that's where we drive that change that Samantha's talking about. Yeah. Totally. Guys, I'm going to pivot just a little bit because I want to make sure that we have uh, – we've got – We've got a lot of questions coming in, so I'm going to give give this 10 more minutes of conversation between us, and then we're going to start taking questions because um, uh, I, I think there's more questions than we'll have, we'll have time for. But that's a good good problem to have, right? Um, so one of the one of the um, uh, questions I wanted to ask you guys about and make sure that we covered is 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 communication in general, um, because communication in general is changing. I think we were um, we were all at the IBM. Conference, and we were we saw IBM verse and how communication is changing, and how uh, how we're going to eventually uh, talk to each other. Um, you know, I Snapchat my daughter when it's time for dinner, and then she comes down. If I call her out loud, she won't come down. So oh my um, God, I want my dad to Snapchat me dinner. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have to communicate with her in the ways that she wants to communicate. Is my point. And so, what I'm curious about is how do you guys think that millennials wish to be communicated with. I mean, I think actually, just just real quick before I uh, finish off um, and and have you answer the question, I think most of you guys we actually tweeted or IM'd or DM'd or Facebook messaged to get here. All th all four of us on this um, on this uh, Google Hangout. So um, it's interesting that we actually communicated that way to get here. So anyway, I just want to make that statement. Um, so. Uh, mm -hmm. what, why don't we? Yeah, go ahead. I, I'd love to hear from you guys in communication and how that, how you think that's gonna, how it's working, how is it gonna change? Brian, I think you just hit it home right there. You you listened to find out where the best place to communicate with your daughter was, right? And then you embraced it, learned it, and you're leveraging it. The idea that you didn't force her to only answer my text messages. You went there and you embraced that technology and understand how to leverage that. I think that's the unique piece there. It's where I mean I document inside Nimble, the social CRM tool that I use the preferred place of communication for everybody I engage with. And the reason I do that is I know that if I tweet it at, tweet at Brian Kramer, he's going to give me a message back. But if I tweet at Ted Rubin, he's going to take a little bit longer, but if I post on his Facebook wall, he'll message me immediately. That is important when we're talking about, because there, it comes back to my favorite hashtag, show you care. I care enough to know how to communicate in a way that you prefer. Yeah. Sam, how about yourself? I read a, there's some, I mean, there's always a study, right? But there's a study that came out that I just read about this morning that showed that retailers res don't respond, do not respond to 84% of the Facebook comments that are made on their Facebook page. That, I think, to, to Brian with an eye, what you were just saying, speaks volumes, right? And, and it's these little forms, you know, how we came to be on this chat, whether it was through Facebook Messenger or whether it was a text or whether it was a tweet. It's you got to be able to to respond to the person in their again in their time on their level in the right playing field, right? So mm -hmm. if someone's posting a question to Facebook, you better answer that question on Facebook. The worst is when you get someone that responds, right? You post a question, let's say on Twitter, and they respond. The brand responds with, "You can call us directly at two one two blah blah blah." It's like. But I, I'm never going to call. I wanted it answered in this channel, this yeah. way. I would have called if I wanted to call. So it's, you gotta, it, it's tough, right? I think it's actually, it's not, I, don't, I actually personally don't think it's tough. I think it's really simple. I think that, it's, that social and digital saves a whole lot of time for everyone. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's, you know, no one wants a three-paragraph answer to anything. They want a quick response, and that's it. Leave the fluff out. We don't care. Just get us the answer, and that's what we'll appreciate. I think that brands that can't, understand that, that they think they need to write a Bible of whatever and they have to run by all the content by their boss, there is no trust, but it just, it blows my mind. It's so simple, yet it's so missed. Samantha, yeah. to your point, you really, you spoke on immediate action, which I think also comes back to it. Not only is that statistic staggering, 84% aren't yeah. responding, but it's also about the, the, the time frame in which the response comes. Um, we don't really like to wait around for a response, we'll just make a different buying decision or we'll commit to a different brand 
Um, so I love that you brought that up. And on the same point of, of branding and not just buying, um, a lot of millennials support other millennials. There's a rise in that movement right now, the idea of for millennials, by millennials. So brands who might be more aged or might be seen by the millennial generation as a bit more archaic or, or fossilized, for lack of a better term, um, we really approach it in a better light when it is branded with millennials supporting it. Whether that's, love, that's, that's, so that's so true, Ashley. I didn't mean to catch up, but I, like, so Sam's example, so Sam is part of the Emerging Leaders crew at, at IBM this past week at a, at a Partner World Focus, which is like an executive level IBM conference. I couldn't have been more happy to tweet out live pictures of this Emerging Thought Leaders group in IBM being empowered and trusted at an event. And I don't work for IBM, but for me, it's in a millennial expressing the fact that, hey, look at this big brand IBM that is empowering and listening to their, their, their emerging leaders. Now, that, I think that's a great point. I think the other point is that whole real-time communication scares many, but we just want to know that we're heard. So it doesn't have to be the answer that you know you, you, you're providing in real time, but it's saying, hey, let me look into that and get back to you. It's the fact that it goes unanswered, and someone like Coca-Cola, who all of a sudden got some really good press initially after so the Super Bowl commercial, they, they were engaging. They were asking people to tweet. I went and I screenshotted their Twitter handle. They had close to 1,000 yeah. automated replies with the exact same message. That is not engagement. That is lazy. So don't, don't ask people to engage and then automate non-personalized responses. That's even worse because I think then you're insulting our intelligence to think that we don't understand that. So I think that real-time, right-time conversation has to be about Prove that you're listening. Just let us know that you're listening. I mean, even Delta, like, I, shout out to Delta. I complained about something. They said, Brian, we hear that a lot. Unfortunately, it's a change. We'll have to go with the union right now. Please, you know, accept our apology. I will, I will advocate for them because they cared enough to engage, not just ignore it. It's funny. The, the Delta example is I always think, right, if you think about that in, from a corporate perspective, right, from a, from a workforce perspective, it's like how many friends do I have and how many times have I gone and how many friends do you guys have that have gone on job interviews, right? You prep, you spend all this time prepping for it, you do all this work and research on the company you're going to, you interview, you don't know if it goes well or not, you email them the thank you note and then you never hear back. There's not a no, sorry, like we really appreciate you coming in, but sorry we gave it to someone else. Or there's, it's like radio silent. And to me, it's like I would rather hear back and them say, send me a one sentence email. Say, hey, Samantha, you know, we decided to give it to someone else. Thanks again for like coming in and meeting with us. Period. End of discussion, right? Same with the brand. It's like we know how easy it is to type out one sentence emails. We know how easy it is and how little time it takes for someone to respond to one Twitter message. Like what Brian's saying, you don't have to give the answer, just respond and let us know that you actually like, got it, and you, you, you know? And, and it's amazing, I, you know, the companies that don't, my best friend, you know, has, has been interviewing recently, not, not naming names, but um, you know, she, she's gotten no response from all these people, and it's unbelievable, and it's like, and now I have a bad taste in my mouth for, you know, for these brands and companies that she's interviewing for that she's not hearing back from because it's word of mouth. She's telling me she's frustrated. Therefore, I'm like, well, I'm never going to recommend anyone to work for that company and maybe I shouldn't buy their product anymore. You know, it really goes, it goes, it works across a lot of things, especially when it comes to word of mouth with, with people. Well, so let me, um, let's just do one, one more question. I'm going to, we just a couple more minutes um, of, uh, something I'm, I'm trying to understand, and, and Ashley, maybe you can help me on this, um, uh, yeah. being a, a career coach to millennials. What, what are you actually coaching? What, what, what is your biggest piece of advice to millennials right now to, to enter the workforce? Let's just, let's, let, or to, to continue and build their, um, their uh, resume, their, their, uh, their, you know, history up. Um, where, where do they start and where, are they, where do they head in, in today's uh, job advancement? I think that it, really picking my best piece of advice comes from the topic that I'm asked about the most. Uh, most people, I focus really on the job hunt and on clarity. So I get hired by a lot of 20 and 30-somethings who are looking to figure out what they want to do with their lives and also get job offers doing it in a quicker amount of time. And what I'm finding is that millennials will pay anything for clarity. Um, I get more clients who will do anything, pay anything. They just want clarity. They want purpose. Um, I've seen a lot of articles talk about how we're the generation of purpose and not a paycheck. And I think in a lot of ways that is true. We want to make great money, but we want to care about how we're making it first and foremost. So my best piece of advice or just kind of statement for millennials to consider is that clarity comes from engagement. 
It does not come from thought. Um, because we are a generation that values purpose on such a deep level, I find that a lot of millennials, by the time they hire me, they're suffering uh, because they've thought themselves and they've marinated to an extent where it's not supporting them in any sort of power. Um, limbo is a very powerless place to be. There's nothing powerful about being in limbo and about infection paralysis and marinating. So really, truly, I think there's something more powerful about engaging, making a commitment, showing up, seeing what feedback you get from the universe and course correcting along the way. And that's what I really support people in doing with educated decisions and clarity on what suits them so that that engagement takes them to the next step. So you're saying sharing and engagement will help people with their own clarity? Yeah, I mean, engagement can mean many things. It can mean going to a networking event. It can mean something as serious as taking a new job that you think you might be interested in. It can mean something as light as reading a book or just going to networking events a bit more often. Um, and I just really work with people to hone in on their great options so they can get out there and engage, be it networking, be it new jobs, be it reading. Brian, what's your advice to millennials trying to build their career right now? You know, I think part of it is, you know, there's no better time in the world than right now to tell your story. You are, you are the, the best person to tell your story. There's nobody better than yourself. And social and marketing and digital, we have that control. And I don't even say it's building your personal brand because then it seems like you're building a persona that doesn't match what they're going to hire. I say that you find your voice and you tell your story and leverage every possible way to do that, including you know social media, go to networking events like Ashley said. I mean, so much of what Ashley was saying, I mean, I would argue that the millennial mindset of people that are looking for jobs are looking for those same things. And the, the, the I guess the notion that millennials are impatient but... Yes, there's lots of other people that are inpatient as well. And I think when a, if you look at a millennial job searching today, I mean, I, I believe in finding your passion, but it doesn't mean your job has to, you know, suit your passion ideally. It has to get you one step closer to finding that passion and ultimately reaching your goal. And I think that's partially why the entrepreneur or solopreneur route has been such a uh, easy grasp thing for a millennial because a millennial then can control their own destiny. And they don't, you know, their, their trust, and I think this is something important, we, we trust in ourselves that we might fail, but we will never settle for failure. And unfortunately, brands sometimes won't trust someone to fail without giving them the chance to, to prove their ultimate success. And I think that's where it has to come down to us telling the story, us you know, engaging and providing that message. And I mean, there's also a little bit of uh, you know, humbleness to it where showing that you are willing to be mentored by someone that's older, willing to reach out to someone like Ashley who has a grasp and understanding to keep it real because it's not all roses and flowers and all these like wonderfulness and I sometimes forget that when I'm coaching or working with some people and I have to give them a dose of reality and say, well, I might talk about all of these things, but this is how many months and years it took me to build a relationship to get that to happen because I think that's part of that the real truth that sometimes we, we forget to, to explain. Fantastic. Sam, anything to add to that? I think Brian briefly touched upon it, but the, he mentioned the word mentor, and I would say you got to redefine mentorship. Um, I think you need to use your network as your mentor. I think don't expect to get a job and to, your boss is going to be your mentor and that's going to be that. It doesn't work like that. You kind of have to, you got to figure it out yourself, and I think that there is nothing more powerful than a mentor or a mentee, um, and that being teaching someone older than you, basically a, a talent exchange, right? You teach them the skills. I think me that millennials and boomers together, specifically, make the like the ultimate dream team, right? You have someone that has experience and that, you know, they're seasoned, like, you know, professionals that know all about experience and what it takes in the workforce, you know, to be a great leader. And millennials, right, have potential. And they have, they know, you know, social and online and digital skills. And when you marry those two things together, whether it's cross-mentorship or it's fine, you know, maybe it's... It, Whatever it may be, if there's a way to figure out how to use your network to find those people, um, I think that, that that's probably the number one piece of advice I could give. Great, great. All right, let's head into uh, some questions from uh, the tweet chat, which I understand is going off right now. So uh, right. I can't wait to, to dive in there once we get off and see. And you guys have all been uh, been getting quoted here uh, quite a bit, so I can't I can't wait for you guys to see it too. Um, all right, so. What um what company do you believe is the most influential in innov innovation uh, innovating relevant digital marketing company to date and why from a millennial millennials perspective uh, and this is coming from the cloud dragon. 
So I'm going to let whoever uh, comes up with something first just kind of jump in. Mm. Well, I, I like uh, Converse. If you like Converse shoes, I'm a Chuck Taylor shoes guy. And they do a great job of never telling me to buy their shoes, never telling me that they're the coolest things, they're on some celebrity. They just they present user generated content and content that is just relative to like what I care about. You know, like they show the new, you know, you can customize shoes and they show people wearing different shoes. I think Converse is a great one. I think another one that does a great job of of really kind of engaging and kind of stepping out of their, you know, total shell is the NFL. If you look at the NFL as like a as a huge brand, and I won't even say they technically target millennials, they do a great job of talking with the community. They do they do Twitter chats. They on their Facebook page they they talked about, you know, did you like the left shark or the right shark better during the halftime show? Like the fact that they know enough to care and engage and ask those questions make me want to even go more. And I think that's where th they're doing a, a really good job of being a brand that is reaching out and actually showing that engagement. Mm. Great. And you can't help but say it, but at the end of the day Apple continues to do an amazing job because they lead with why and we just can't help but love our iPhones. I think that there's still some room for improvement in the company, for example with Siri. I think a lot of millennials are getting impatient with the fact that Apple is so beautiful except for Siri just not doing the job that she can be doing. Um, but on the same token, Apple leads with why and that brings us back to the TED Talk I mentioned. Um, really explaining what, what the company believes in. I think Apple does a great job by talking about innovation, believing in beautiful design. Um, if you're not going to leave with a cause, you need to leave with cutting edge innovation to attract the attention of millennials. And their cult, their cult following definitely helps them for sure. Of course, I have a I have a tweet out to Tim uh, Kim, Tim Cook to come on my podcast and explain to me why they don't have a Twitter account because I think their Apple Genius Bar is the best of the best when it comes to technology. But I can't tweet at them, and that drives me crazy. So yeah, I love that. I, I, I was talking to uh, Joe Polizzi from uh, Content Marketing Institute, and and it was interesting. Um, we were having a great discussion at the table of uh, content marketers around. Um, that topic in Apple and and uh, it was debated that they did not have uh, social presence and the other debate the other side of it is that they have one of the greatest social presences on earth and that their community may not be uh, built in a two-way street on social but it's built in those genius bars um, you can walk in and have a conversation with with anyone from Apple and it's probably closest anyway what do you guys think of that do you think that they have a community or they do not I think they have a community not on social, but I think I, I think you can have a community on social, but all that really matters is that you have a community. Period. Um, I think that I, I don't think it. You know, they don't fit into buckets. I think the the sense is that if you have a community that's you know that are active brand advocates, that's they've got that. So. Well, I think that the, the true great communities now are extending online and offline. It's not disconnected between the two. Yeah. Apple might have, and to Ashley's point, I mean, you can thank Guy Kawasaki and the, the cult following that began and the fact that they deliver, right? They provide a product that always works. I mean, I, I love Android phones. I'm actually, I will soapbox say that I'm testing out the new Windows device right now that Lumia provided me. But the thing about Apple is it always works, and they've built a, a community like Ashley said on innovation and technology. My disconnect is... Why not amplify and leverage that? Because I agree with you, Brian. I think they have a dark social presence that is probably better than none, better than everyone. Because I jailbroke every iPhone I've ever had. I post and share all of that stuff. I guarantee they take that feedback and that information and put it in their product cycle. But why would they not want to celebrate that? Why would they not want to hire me to show, help celebrate the awesome stuff they're doing? That's my yeah, one other brand that I just can't help but mention is Virgin America. Millennials love Virgin America. I don't know one millennial who would prefer to fly any other airline than Virgin. Not only are they doing a killer job, but they're branding Richard Branson as a leader in technology and innovation. He's one uh, example of a brand that has more followers as a CEO than the brand uh, handle itself. Yeah. So really, truly, I think Virgin America really exudes, a, from a social standpoint, um, what brands should be going for. And not only that, but when you get on the airplane and you see their cartoon, it's really cutting edge. Um, they've stepped out of the typical um, Southwest United Airlines video of buckling your seatbelt and they've gotten into something that's fun, amusing, and engaging. A lot of millennials love to watch. Um, and so I think that they are a beautiful example of what a lot of brands should be striving for in connecting with the millennial and in connecting with the consumer and providing a, a better experience. Yeah, um, if you go, their user experience is unbelievable. Their redesigned website, they redesigned it about six months ago and their app are just, their user experience just couldn't be, it's about as real and as, as awesome as it gets. 
Mm-hmm. And Brian, Brian Kramer, I mean, we, we have experience. We, we were lucky to watch and witness the UFC. We went to a UFC invite and got VIP uh, stands. And, I mean, the way that they amplify and use their community, engage on Twitter handles, they've built – I mean, their UFC might be one of the strongest brands. And to Ashley's point on Richard Branson, I mean, Dana White and, and Joe Rogan, who are two of the faces of that brand, have just as many, if not more, followers, and they have their own podcast, their own TV shows, because – it's all about them sharing with the community what they're doing, that value. I mean, the UFC is another one where it's a it's a fighting sport that is, is I mean, across all age groups has, has done a great job of empowering and creating that conversation and, and telling stories. And I think that's something that other brands can leverage, just like Virgin America and some of those other ones. Yeah. And, like, one last thing I'll throw in, just one, because I didn't get to mention my brand, but I have kind of a, a different kind of answer. I think it's I think that small businesses do a really, really nice job. A lot of small businesses, not all. But a lot of small businesses don't get credit for doing such a great job with their social and their their digital. Um, I think that small businesses, for having probably much smaller budgets and less people working for them, are able to do more things than some of the biggest brands out there. Um, you, know, you know what's funny about that? They, they have less budget. They have more trust in their employees. Exactly. Exactly. Right. And that's why they're able to respond in two seconds rather than wait a full day. Exactly. So let me move on to another question, unless you guys had something else there. Um, and we can always weave back in some brands as you think about them. But um, how how do you build trust with millennials? Um, sorry, let me. That was not a question. That was a comment. Uh, I'm, I'm going to move to the next one. With authenticity as a key value component to millennials, is celebrity-based campaigns too much of a risk? That's from D Hash. Mm. Celebrity-based campaigns. I think it really depends on the celebrity that you're choosing. The millennials aren't responding in the same way they are to the Paris Hiltons of the world anymore. Um, and so really choosing cause-based celebrities that, you know, Angelina Jolie, there's a really good response because of her humanitarian work for whatever she represents. So um, I don't think that there's an issue with celebrity-based campaigns when it comes to connecting with millennials. I think the issue comes up if you're not cho- choosing your, your celebrity very wisely. Um, you know, we live in the generation of reality television, and some of the reality TV may be watched, but it's not always respected. Um, there's a lot of millennials who might enjoy those television shows, but if you put a brand on one of those reality stars, it's not going to create the same response um, as one would think. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it depends on what kind of reaction you're going for. If you're looking to get a lot of uh, articles on, about it on there, and you know a lot of people blogging about it, a lot of articles out there, if you're looking for a quick hit, I think a celebrity is fantastic. You want to get you know a fire going fast, it's going to be put out in about, you know, Less than a week, I think that's fantastic. But if you're looking for a loyal, cam- you know, for to get a loyal following and a campaign that really touches, you know, the hearts and the emotional side of of, of the consumer, that's I don't think that's that's not going to be the way to go. Um, but but then again, a lot of people are looking for the virality and for the hype and for the you know. So it really depends, I think, on what your ultimate goal is. Yeah, if, I think that's the key right there. The ultimate goal of the campaign. If you want it to be top of word water cooler. There's value there in that ultimate reach and that that thing. But if you want to sell them, if you want to relate with your customer, your end bottom line, I'm not buying something because Beyonce drinks it. I'm buying it because Brian Kramer posts on his Instagram. That's I mean that's the difference there. And I think the closer we get the influencer to the community, the more trust the millennial has. And that, if that millennial actually has a rapport and has built up something over time, that is that's the person you need to empower. And I, I believe. This is the start of employees as the rock stars of their brands in these marketing campaigns. Because don't tell me why IBM is great. Give me an IBM employee. Put them up there telling about what they're doing great. I'll believe their culture because it comes from that person much more than because their website says they have a great culture. And on the same note of celebrity endorsements, I think a lot of millennials see through it when they're scripted tweets or scripted uh, Facebook comments. We can tell when they're promoting for a brand and when they were paid for the tweet. Um, And so it's really important also the context in which a celebrity is talking about a product. When you say that, the first thing I think of, which is my biggest piece of advice to any marketer or any company, right, is run whatever you're going to do by a millennial employee at your company. Don't just sit in a room with top-level executives and talk about a plan, and you read this study and this article about how millennials love authenticity, so let's do X, Y, and Z. If you don't run that by millennial employees, your free marketing focus group, you might as well not exist. Oh, that's a great idea. I like that. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's let's uh, let me ask you guys another question here from Stephanie Dobbins. I um, apologize if I'm not uh, uh, saying your name right. Um, the question is, what's the difference in getting a millennial to the buy button 
than other kinds of demographics. Mm. What demographics are you guys focused on? Uh, that's a great question. From, I mean, Stephanie's uh, a rock star over at Dynamic Signal employee uh, advocacy t tool, and um, I think that's a great question because I think the buy button is an interesting one, right? Because I think it's almost that impulse buy still plays into our day-to-day -day life. Like I, I've, I've talked about that a lot, but one of the things for me is as you know, a brand, and I'll use Best Buy as an example. If if a brand or a, a brick and mortar place does not provide me Wi-Fi or um, a way for me to comparison shop with Amazon or the other ones online, and you make me go outside to use my cell phone, I'm not going back in the store to pay four dollars more for the product. But if I have, you know, if you provided me Wi-Fi, you know, and, and back to Sam's point of like, you know, I am where my Wi-Fi is, where I work, where Wi-Fi. I mean. If, I, if I'm in that store physically holding something and it's going to cost me $4 more but I was able to check and compare, I'm going to buy that in the store. So I think part of it has to be is you can't be scared of being out-competed by the online or out-competed by the, the trendy piece, but you have to be able to understand and embrace that consumer being connected, that hyper-connection. And don't just put sponsored ads in my in my you know Twitter feed because I'll just retweet them because I know it costs you money. But you know do it with, that you're actually providing value in that sponsored uh, post. I love yeah. that. And by the way, I got her name right. She just tweeted me. I just wanted yeah. to know. Go ahead. Yeah, on the same note, honestly, I think that this is an even more simple question than um, we could really make it is we're the generation that has suffered the most unemployment and with the combination of being highly educated. At the end of the day, we are really minding our budgets. And I think what really makes a difference with the buy button is not going to be a freebie. It's not going to be a giveaway. It's going to be a, a discount. Uh, millennials buy discounted goods and at the end of the day if you're competing with other products or other platforms that are selling the same goods what's really going to make the difference is the price and it is the cutbacks and that's just simple I think. If you add in a handwritten thank you note after I buy it I'll buy from you a million times over again. Ah. And, and, I'll, and I'll share it on social media and now I'm influencing my friends. Exactly. Like, that's a key. That, I mean like attention to detail. The reason Apple is amazing is because when you open that box it's an experience. Think about creating experiences for your consumer, and I promise you all will share it. But if it's just the same old thing I have to cut out of a ridiculously hard, you know, plastic paper that you don't care because I'm just a number, I mean, I'm not posting that on, on social media. So I mean, don't you don't have to pay me to, sh to share good stuff. Uh, provide me an experience, and I'll promote the hell out of you. Yeah, and also I think the salespeople, when you're on the floor, or whether it's online and, and who you're tweeting with, you know, whether it's you know for Zappos, you're you know you're tweeting with their direct employees, and when you're in in the you know in the physical store, you're the you know if you can look everything up on your phone, but at the end of the day, nothing beats real human to human. Oh. <laughs> where's the sound effect? <laughs> <laughs> um, nothing, nothing beats uh, real human to human interaction, right? So if you're going to go to a store, you're going there for a reason. <laughs> And you want to talk to an employee, and again, it goes down to the trust factor. Because if that store, if their executives or whoever it is at that store trust their employees to have conversations with you and talk about competitors and what the difference is and all of that is, then you're really going to trust them, and you're going to end up going with whatever that may be, no matter if there's a discount or not. I think. Fantastic. So, uh, so discounts, flexibility, working from home. I'm getting it. I'm picking up on it. Okay, so <laughs> I'm giving you guys a uh, uh, hard time here. Okay, so how do you, this is from, sorry again, Constans, um, HH chat, how do you integrate intrin intrinsic and extrin extrinsic motivation into discussion of trust and engagement by millennials? How do you in integrate intrinsic and extrinsic motivation? How do you motivate into this discussion, trust and engagement. What's the I big say, I say aspire to inspire. Mm -hmm. I mean, to, to Ashley's point, she said, get, you know, the cause element, you know, we want to make a difference. We want to know that, we're, that what we're doing can provide value that can ultimately better our lives or even other people's lives. So, I mean, part of that to me is, you know, you don't have to advertise and, like, overly promote the fact that you're you're helping at the soup kitchen. But, you know, the idea that one dollar of everything, you know, like, I'll use an example, Mission Belts, they went on Shark Tank, and they, you know, had lots of people buying things from them, and they donated one dollar of everything, every piece that was bought to a cause that they were supporting. 
I mean, to me, I will pass up a belt that I need on the store to go online to buy it, probably for more money, because I know that they care enough that they're trying to make a difference. And I think that cause element motivates me. That's what that it, it inspires me. And unfortunately, by just you know saying like, oh, we donate fifteen percent of our profit to A, B, and C, that doesn't do it. I think you have to tell the story on how story. you're making a All difference. That story, yeah. I think also storytelling, which is kind of where you ended off with, is what really differentiates lots of brands and what makes people buy is we attach to stories, especially millennials. So at the end of the day, if your brand has a story, it has a pulse, it has a heart, um, we are going to connect on a deeper level. And that doesn't necessarily even mean a cause that's tied to, but it means that it still has a reason. Um, I mean, there's so many different brands that really do this. There's also different basketball players, um, think, you know, or sports athletes. Think about millennials and how we feel about the athlete that came from nothing and that fought their way to the top, and that's a part of their story. We're going to root from them, no for them no matter what their talent level may be compared to other players because we're attached to their story. Um, and so I think brands really need to motivate uh, other buyers by having an authentic story with a pulse for their business. Businesses need a pulse to them in order to really get millennials motivated to connect, buy, and be loyal to them. Yeah, and I think the way to get businesses to do that, or if you're sitting there at your computer saying, this is nice to hear, but how the heck do I get my company to trust us? Results. Show them results from companies that, that have done it. Show them you know, results from what happens when you have employees that believe in your brand and how often they'll actually tweet about your brand to how many amount of followers and get retweets from that and retweets from that. I mean, that authentic you know, messaging from your own employees or from friends and friends of employees is worth a whole lot more ROI than anything else is, I think. So let me um, let me dive into just, uh, we've got time for just two more quick questions. Um, and uh, Carlos Gill just called me out as the old guy uh, <laughs> on this, so I, I'd like to, I'd like to uh, pay a little, little compliment back that I am not that old yet. Um, okay, so uh, the next question is, I'm, I've am wondered, this is from M. Han, Hannaford, I've wondered um, this for a while, what age do you consider the uh, oldest millennials right now? 32. Really? Uh, I disagree. I, I research, uh, 1980 and anyone born after 1980. Yeah, That's how I'm 34. I, well, Generation Z kind of comes in, in two, around 2000 um, birth dates, in my opinion, so I think that really, truly 1980 to 2000. Yeah, I think that's right. And actually, I, a lot of the research that I was reading on, like the Pew study, I, I posted a post about the millennial mindset this morning. And the Pew study and IBM study and WhiteHouse.org study just yesterday that I was going through, a lot of it was focused on the 1980 to 2000. But I, I, I challenge back and say, think about the mindset element when people are worried about that age, because. I mean, there is plenty of people, that New Way to Work event that Brian was talking about where we actually all met. I met this whole panel, you know, that, that event, there was lots of people on there that it, at that event from an influencer perspective that were very millennial mindset. They want culture. They want to make a difference. They're technology enabled. So I think that's part of this conversation is that when you're thinking about what age it is, I'd rather you not worry about what age you fall into and worry about do your philosophies match those of what the generations are kind of driving to, to yeah. succeed? Yeah, I always say I work with with um, Bruce Nora at my at IBM. I you know his ha famous hashtag he created is a hashtag. Well, just between me and him is a hashtag MIBB, right? A millennial in a boomer's body. Or yeah. you know, I know plenty of sixty-five year old millennials, and I know plenty of twenty-four year old boomers. So, <laughs> with with Brian saying, it's really all about the mindset. I think it's true. Also, just to add on to that, I've seen unprecedented numbers of thirty-somethings lately hiring me to support them in getting clarity in a transition. I have a client who's a doctor leaving her medical career behind, trying to figure out what she authentically wants to do. Um, so I'm seeing a lot of traces of the millennial mindset when it comes to wanting to work for a purpose, showing up in Generation X as well. Um, so it's not to say that there is really a number that cuts it off, um, but the data and from what I'm seeing the most um, as far as research goes, I'm really seeing 32, 34 really pushing it at the highest age that I'm seeing researchers calling a millennial. Yeah, so I'm definitely not a millennial. Um, <laughs> okay, so at heart, <laughs> at, heart. at heart, we've you seen. Go with Brian's definition. Anybody can be a millennial. True. <laughs> I love it. Um, and actually, Carlos, Carlos then sent a, a question actually to me. So I'll just take just a second to answer it. Um, as a non-millennial, thanks for calling me out again. How do you view millennials? Curious to hear your thoughts. Um, so that is a good question. I, um, you know, it's really weird. I've never actually gotten along with anyone my own age. 
Um, so I don't really kind of view age as any, I've never viewed age as a, um, as a, as something that determines how much you can, uh, do in this, in your lifetime. Um, I always got along with people that were, when I was younger, I got along with people that were older and now that I'm not old, but now that I'm older, I would say I get along with people that are younger. So, uh, and, and vice versa. So I, I don't really view age and this is kind of a, a tough uh, question I, I'd love to hear from you guys too is is age really um, you know does it establish does it determine do you see yourselves as Millennials simply because that's what we placed you know as a title on this whole thing but um, but it, it you know I how many people right now are young and have changed completely the direction of the ways that companies go uh, Mark Zuckerberg is one of the youngest billion top 10 billionaires top seven billionaires uh, in the world, um, you know, look at uh, uh, LinkedIn. Um, what's his name? The uh, CEO. Again, a young guy. Uh, look at um, look at half of uh, half, if not most, of the people that own tech companies or social media companies, and they are all quite young. So, I mean, I would I would debate age as any in in any conversation as what establishes um, you know what what success you can have. And I'll even flip it the other way on that, Brian. I'll even say that. Just because you're older doesn't mean you have experience that's valuable. Just because you're younger doesn't mean you don't have experience. Because I think that that is often the idea that the only you know, and I, it it drove me out of a job because at UPS when I took a job there after college, I couldn't get a tech job. They told me you're the best person in this entire house. In 13 years, when you have enough years built up, we'll promote you. Yeah. That does not that does not inspire me or motivate me because why would I continue doing work? So I think it's that idea that. I don't think it's age equals experience or age equals a, that mindset. I think it's the idea that not only telling your story, but what difference are you going to make? I don't want to know about what you did 15 years ago because the pace of change has, I mean, this is, our innovation is at a speed we've never seen before. So, I mean, it's, everything that you talked about last year is probably morphed into something new this year. So I think it's, that's the key. So if it's the age thing, it's who, how good are you at building on all that experience and doing great things tomorrow, not just living on what you did yesterday? You know, you also tapped in, Brian, on kind of the generational divide and one of the key differentiators being Gen X um, identified as a generation that puts their head down and respects ranking order. And our generation is millennials who just step into the CEO's office and share ideas, and that's what we believe in. And whether or not a workforce, a workplace culture supports this, the reality is this is the millennial mindset. We're going to be 50% of the workforce in 2020 and up to 75% of the workforce within five years to 10 years of that. So. At the end of the day, this is a democracy of ideas, and that is what it is. So the more that CEOs um, enforce a culture of supporting millennials and sharing their ideas, one recommendation is for managers to create a weekly meeting or a biweekly meeting where they encourage ideas, because that is the number one way to allow your employees to feel like they are engaged with the company and they are a part of something greater than themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Sam, what about yourself? Anything yeah. I'm all about it. I, I always say that it's not about you know your age. It's about what you can contribute. You know, you may have millennials that don't come up with ideas and they're totally disengaged and they're not interested in being engaged. And there's nothing you can do about it. Um, so yeah, I would say number one, you know, just because you're millennial, you know, no, not you know, obviously not one millennial is the same as another millennial. I know a lot of millennials that are you know that are go getters and and always like eager you know, to tackle the next thing and come up with ideas. And I know others that don't really care, and that's fine too. But I do think that there needs to be that distinction in terms of what your contribution is. I think there's a reason why people are leaving companies to go to startups where they can be at the same table as the CEO and the COO and the CFO and their ideas are equally as important as, the, as they are, right? Whether you're the, you know, whether you're the you know, receptionist that sits outside the elevator, your ideas are just as, you know, as important as their are. theirs are because they're a small team you have to go into that trusting each other, otherwise you're screwed. And I think that more big companies need to take on that mentality, that age is just a number, that it, you know, a corner office is just a corner office, and that an idea, no matter if it's from me, the, you know, the, the, you know, the, the person answering the phone, or the, the CIO, it doesn't matter. An idea is an idea, and a good idea is, is, is a good idea. I love it. I love it. So many quotable things here. And we, you know, I don't know if you guys realize, but I could keep talking to you guys for another hour, but we are literally out of time. But wait, but Brian, that's the whole point, right? Is like when Carlos asks you that, you're not a very good person to ask that to because you're having this conversation. The problem is the companies and the people that are not having this conversation, the ones that don't care, 
they don't care enough to walk outside of their you know corner office and ask the you know millennial sitting 20 feet like from them. But so so when you're asked that question, what you say is the ideal, right? That's what every millennial hopes that their boss or that that their you know executives are going to say. But it just unfortunately it just it isn't it isn't the case. You know what? That gets an extra. <laughs> and and uh, and and thank you, thank you guys. I really appreciate you guys taking some time to do this. I I would love to do this again um, with with you guys. I mean, we have we had a great conversation. I think we could have another another one um, if you guys are up for it. And um, and it's great, awesome guys. And and to everyone out there, thank you all for participating. Um, really appreciate it. This will be up in the next, I guess, uh, 24 hours. Uh, so if you want a recording or you want to send it on, please feel free to do that. Uh, we're going to plan on doing these HTH chats uh, ongoing now, so really looking forward to it. And you guys made my first experience on an HTH chat fantastic. So thank you, guys. Appreciate thank it. You. Brian, thank thanks you, Brian. for having me. Thank you. All right. We'll talk to you guys soon. Sounds good. All right. Bye.